This is the Cis Lunar Experience. I'm your host, J. Vincent Moroli. We look up for weeks, for months. That is all we have done. Look up. And there it is. The top. Only it's different now. So near. So close. Only a little more than a thousand feet above us. It's no longer just a dream. A high dream in the sky. But a real and solid thing. And that was a quote from Tenzin, uh, the Sherpa that first summited Mount Everest in recorded history, uh, along with a Brit who did it as well. Kiwi, actually. Kiwi. Ah, well, that's kind of fitting there. Uh, and the reason for that quote is, one, it's just awesome. It makes you dream about bigger and broader things. Uh, but the second reason is that our guest today, Daniel Faber, CEO of Orbit Fab, tends to be a fan of that quote, knows a bit more of the backstory, like that it was a Kiwi and not a Brit. Uh, and that quote and the name is pretty integral to the story of Orbit Fab. So I wanted to start us off there. Daniel, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Great to be here, Vincent. Absolutely. So so that's just just correct me right there, right? So what's what's some more of that story of the, the summit of Mount Everest uh, for those out there that are curious on the history there? Well, this is the, the first time that people had been to the top of Mount Everest, the, the highest mountain on earth. Hmm. People had tried and failed. People had, had gone up and died. People had wrote poetry about it. It had been asked, mm. why go? And the answer that Mallory gave was because it's there. It's something that was aspired to. And then they achieved it. Hmm. And there was a, a Nepalese Sherpa, Tenzing, who may have been the first at the top, and, uh, and his colleague, Mm-hmm. Sir Edmund Hillary there from Norway, uh, from Norway, from New Zealand. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, and they took up bottles of oxygen because at that altitude, mm. you will really suffer without oxygen. Yeah. And so we uh, we named our first mission to space after Tenzing Norgay, the Sherpa, hmm. uh, partly because it was fitting as a as a metaphor, partly because he he'd taken oxygen and we were taking oh. Hydrogen peroxide, but an oxygen source. Yeah, it's got O, it's got H. Yes. And, and partly because we were riding on a spaceflight Sherpa vehicle. And it just seemed fitting. <laughs> Wait, that was the name of the vehicle? The vehicle that the deployer that we were on is yeah. an orbital transfer vehicle called Sherpa. <sighs> Fantastic. And that was, was that with Transastra or who, who was that one with? Spaceflight. Spaceflight is Space the, Flight. The, the company that brokers a lot of launches. Gotcha. And we were on a SpaceX rocket, but we were attached to the Spaceflight Sherpa vehicle gotcha. on one of the Esper ports that, uh, that went to space. And that was uh, June last year. Okay. Yeah, you guys have been just rocking and rolling in the last few years. Because OrbitFab is, what, what's like inception? Four years? Something like that? We found it in 2018. Okay. We had uh, we yesterday. had our first tanker test bed on the International Space Station within a year. Uh, 2018 and then 2019, a second tanker test bed to space station. We transferred water between the two. Nice. And uh, we're able to test the feed systems and things. I mean, we want to build a propellant supply chain in orbit. Yeah. And so we had to just start by testing some of that basic technology. And actually, we became the first private company to resupply the space station with water in 2019. Mm. So we started to fulfill our vision of being that supply chain right off the bat. Oh, I love that. For, for the water supply on ISS, like clearly that what you guys demonstrated tests the concept of it, right? Hey, we can deliver water up there. Hey, we can transfer it from one vehicle to another. The ISS, remind me, does it have a, I know it has like a recycling facility on the ISS, doesn't it also have like a water production facility with like oxygen and hydrogen or am I getting too sci-fi either? <laughs> what they actually do, they, they take up water and break it into oxygen and hydrogen so that they can breathe the oxygen. Oh, the reverse, but okay. But then they breathe out carbon dioxide mm-hmm. and they have a Sabatier reactor that will turn the carbon dioxide into methane and water. Oh, great. So they're recycling the oxygen. Yeah. But then the carbon of course has come up in food Right, and that's mm-hmm. being combined with the hydrogen. They end up venting that, well, wow. and so they're wasting they're wasting methane. Mm. Yeah, fascinating. But uh, the the system isn't isn't perfect. They don't recycle everything they have up there. So sure. every year they're also taking up about three tons of water. 
okay. and, and NASA organizes and plans all of that. And and we broke that process and delivered the water ourselves. Okay, fantastic. In, in pretty small quantity, right? Just to demonstrate the capabilities. Yeah, it was it was pretty modest. Cool. When when we built that first. Uh, demonstration units that we sent up these test beds mm-hmm. um the, the one had three gallons of water and the other one was empty so we pumped the water across between them gotcha. but we we discovered nasa told us that the water is actually very dangerous for astronauts because there's Why no that? gravity it it doesn't drain from your face so if it happens to get out and gets on an astronaut's yeah. face they can drown in a gallon of water oh my gosh. You, you can't brush it away <laughs> because surface tension will just wrap it back over your face and you can't yell for help because you're under an inch of water. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's terrifying. It's a catastrophic level hazard. That's, yeah. that's NASA's terminology. Wow. And they throw the book at you for those. Yeah. So they told us it would take 24 months to do all the safety, make sure that we had the, the interlocks and controls and redundancy and everything. And so we did it in four months <laughs> because we had to. We were a startup. We yeah. got in and really understood what is the requirement? Why is it dangerous? How do you fix it? Mm-hmm. What's in the rules? But what were the rules written for and what do we actually need to achieve? Yeah. And so where can you bend them and get them to sign off on it because it's still inherently safe? Right. And James Boltitude, our, our CTO, is absolutely brilliant. Okay. Built the relationships with the NASA people, really nice. understood what matters, got behind sort of all the technical things, found out how to, how to you know, go through that process of qualification lightning quick. And mm. so we did it in four months. Dang. And so the, the difficulty there from like a a NASA perspective is if these two mechanisms incorrectly lock and then there's a leak, then the water gets out and gets on circuit boards or gets on your face in that catastrophic level, right? That, that's right. And and you can imagine any way that mortal might leak. If the tank that we had it in okay. sprung a leak, if the pipes inside our tank, if the pumps, if any of those seals, the connections between the two, yeah. the valves, that like there were so many bits of that system, right? Yeah. And so we had to put in place controls and interlocks and should we have two astronauts there, one to keep an eye on the other, because mm. that would class as one level of control, right? Sure. So, so there's a whole bunch of different things that class as controls. And this is where the back and forth with NASA, and they're not unreasonable, right? right. This is astronauts' lives at risk. This is a, a $200 billion space station. Oh, yeah. And then we pump water into the water bus after all this. And they're like, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're pumping water into the space station water bus. This is all the pipes and, okay. and what have you. If you overpressurize that uh. and it happens to spring a leak, now you've got water loose on the space station somewhere. Do we have to evacuate a $200 billion space station? We oh, are not doing gosh. that. You're not going to make that happen. Did we months. say catastrophic level hazard? <laughs> that is the... Uh, they throw the book at you for a reason. Yeah. Like they're, not, they're not kidding around. And so we had to take that very, very seriously. Dang. Okay, so so what you guys just demonstrated is you built the incredible team and you said, all right, 24 months, okay, whatever. What are the actual requirements? We need to do this faster, faster, faster. Um, one of the things that I have found in the space industry, in the startup world is, there's no shortage of visionaries. Like you, you throw a rock in Denver and you're going to hit someone that, you know, thinks that they can be the first one to build an O'Neill colony or, or et cetera, et cetera. Um, the problem that a lot of space founders come into is space takes a long time, typically, although apparently not at Orbit Fab, if you can do it in four months and demonstrate that technique. Um, talk to me a little bit about, about your story, about, you know, maybe initially where you first fell in love with space, but also I know you, you've got some previous experience in the space industry that, that didn't maybe pan out the way that you wanted it to. What are some of the lessons that like gathered from that to make Orbit Fab really move so quickly? Yeah, space often goes slowly. I agree with that. Um, and we try to go quickly. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that it's a short road to achieve the kind of things that we want to achieve. Our vision at okay. Orbit Fab is a bustling in space economy that can support permanent jobs in space. Yeah. When I was when I was at university, I wanted to do something impactful for the world, something that was good for humanity. Hmm. And the one thing that I thought might be the, the the biggest thing to happen to humanity, perhaps ever, was to become an interplanetary species. Right? How do we get off this rock? Mm-hmm. But I was in Australia. I was doing university in Sydney. Okay. And. There's no space agency. Well, there wasn't back then. What year was that? This is back in uh, the late 90s. Okay. 
and it's a no space agency, no big aerospace companies that would that would give me a path I could follow. Sure. So I just thought, well, I guess I'll have to do this myself. How do we do this? Hmm. And I wrote down a list of all the industries that I thought could pay for the first permanent job in space. Nice. And my list only had th- two things on it. Well, it had three. Hmm. Space-based solar power, tourism, and mining. Problem was I could, was doing engineering and I can math, so I crossed out space-based solar power, <laughs> and that left okay. tourism and mining. Hmm. And I couldn't see myself as a tour operator, so that left mining. I left mining. And so I basically spent 25 years pushing on the rope trying to make asteroid mining happen. Yeah. Um, I got to build a dozen spacecraft around the world. That was pretty cool. Yeah. And then this is company number four. <laughs> so wow. things do happen slowly, especially yeah. when you're trying to bootstrap something like this. Hmm. And what we're doing now, I've realized you have to chip away at the small things, right? You need a map. Right. Or at least a direction. Because, vision. Because coming up with a map is, yeah, a vision. Right? Coming up with a map is you need to know what's going to happen to come up with the latest stages of the map. Sure. But if you know the direction that you need to go, hmm. you can go, move in that direction and incrementally build the things that you need to build. So we go from millions of people living in space to the first permanent job in space, which will be a paradigm shift, hmm. yeah. to the bustling in space economy and what's needed to do that. Hmm. But you can't bustle without fuel. Let's build the fuel supply. Yeah. Okay, but what are we doing today? We we can't build a fuel supply because the equipment to deliver that fuel doesn't exist. So we had to build a gas cap. Hmm. So right now, I'll be honest, we're a gas cap company. (laughs) That's how we put humans in space. Okay, so you're a gas cap company right now. We're a gas cap company. Okay, Not, not not the full gas station, not yet. We'll get there. We will. Standard oil, maybe maybe someday, possibly. We'll say, <laughs> maybe a little less uh, knee kneecap cracking than those guys. I don't think we need that. Yeah, yeah, fair, fair enough. So, so talk to me about this. This is this is your interface. This is Rafty. Yeah, this should be viewable. This in is that Rafty. One. It's uh, ooh, that was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so this is this is Rafty. It's uh, got grapple fixtures here. So there's uh, sort of four channels that four fingers on the active side grip into and pull it together at high force. Okay. This, this is one of the things we found out on the on the first flight to the International Space Station. Yeah. We tested a couple of different mechanisms, um, you know, magnetic or, or a bayonet type fitting. Hmm. Uh, and what we found was we needed the mechanical connection for the robustness, uh, but we needed that uh, sort of everything all in one in the simplicity. When we talked to a, a few dozen potential users mm-hmm. about how it should be configured, what they wanted to see, those types of things. We then combine that with our vision for a low-cost refueling architecture. Sure. And said, okay, the, the first thing that drives cost in satellite servicing is robot arms. So can ah. we dock without robot arms? So this allows us just to bump and grab. And in gotcha. that way, we've got a docking fixture here with the two fueling ports in the middle. And the fingers provide a pretty rough alignment. And then uh-huh. in the front, you can see the, the little grooves so those, oh, yeah. those grooves there are lined up with what they call canoe spheres to make okay. a kinematically connect correction. It's basically a, a perfect alignment of the of the two pintles that go down the middle. Okay, so, so real quick. So robot arm entails a grapple and a X degree of movement versus you guys are just the grab. Bump and grab. Bump and grab. You okay. got it, yeah. Much, Tracking. Much simpler from a mechanism perspective. Yeah. Not necessarily simpler or harder from a docking perspective because there are different requirements, right? We, we're not going to hover just away from it and have an arm grow out. Yeah. We need to come in and actually contact. And so, yeah, we have to solve that, that system level problem. Okay. And so, yeah, it's got, it's got two fueling ports in the rafty valve. One is typically used for fuel and the other for uh, blowdown gas or purge gas. Hmm. Sometimes you might pull a vacuum on this to help get the fuel to go into the other port. Okay. And so typically there are two for uh, for a monopropellant. Uh, and so that's why we had two. Uh, it makes the whole system then more compact. So so we flush that out because because some of our listeners will be, you know, aerospace engineers. Mm-hmm. Some of them won't be. Why if if a fuel an example fuel would be hydrazine. Hydrazine's a good one. Okay. That sounds like just one one fuel. Why do you yep. need two ports for something a container with hydrazine in it? So how do you get the hydrazine out when it's in the tank and in space? You have to push it out typically. And so often you'll have a bladder down the middle and a compressed gas on the other side. 
And as the fuel gets pushed out, the compressed gas expands but keeps pushing on it. Okay. And so you have to put the gas in somehow into your empty tank. Yeah. So one side you put fuel and the other side you put the empty gas. Okay. And then the spacecraft that you're that this is attached to just has two lines that they've maybe planned on. Mm-hmm. One goes to hydrazine, one goes to the back of the tank and fills up the bladder. That's exactly right. So okay. there's your two lines that come out to there. Okay. So then we have the, the two fluid ports. And, and these have, in the back here, there's, there's triple seals in those, each of those. Hmm. So as the seal is made with the pin tool pushing down the, uh, the middle, you, you seal first one and then two seals. And then the third one moves an inner pin tool out of the way. Okay. And that create, uh, clears the third seal. So that means we can evacuate and flush the front mm-hmm. area, check for leaks before making the second seal. So it's okay. always safe. And so that's, uh, that's then uh, enough uh, re- reliability and redundancy that you can use it on the ground when you're near people, mm. even with a very toxic fuel like hydrazine. So okay. re- range safety, 91710 uh, standards compliant is, okay. is what we, we always look at. Gotcha. But it lets us use this, this fueling port then for fueling on the ground before you launch the satellite. Gotcha. And because it's made to be grappled and, and fueled automatically in space, mm-hmm. a lot of the constellation operators see this as a way, if they've got you know tens of thousands of satellites, a fueling operation that is labor intensive, that's mm. not a great thing. So we can abolish that labor intensive step by using the robotics. And they're interested in just using this to save money on ground fueling. Just on the initial launch. Of course, then it's in space. They have the option of extending the life because we deliver fuel. Mm. Okay, so it's really, okay, so so let's talk about that. So, yeah, I guess small satellites first of the a constellation of Starlink or something equivalent thereof. Mm-hmm. Uh, most people will have heard of that one. What's like the, roughly, the mass of the fuel versus the entire satellite there? It, it really varies depending on the spacecraft, where they are, what the mission is. Okay. Uh, spacecraft to low Earth orbit. 10% of the mass, something like that. Okay. Spacecraft to geostationary orbit can be more than 50%. Ooh. Okay, so geo satellites, big as a school bus, hopefully not filled with children because you need some air out there. You go in strange places. <laughs> <laughs> that I do. Um, tons and tons of fuel required for those guys out there. Yeah. Why has no one been able to refuel in the past, right? We, we've done that on aircraft down on the ground for years. Air Force has these massive uh, Airbuses or C-5s that just take fuel and stay in the air basically forever. Why has no one been able to do that in space? When did the first air tanker get built and used? That's a good question. Uh, Google. (laughs) I would say, here's a random guess. I'm hoping you know the answer to correct me. Let's go 87. I think it was a bit earlier than that. Okay. That, that but it was still a long time after aircraft started flying. Okay. Right? It was maybe 50 years. Huh. Okay, we've had satellites for 50 years. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a good I, enough answer. The, the answer is you, you've got to build the infrastructure and the technology. Yeah. Right? And so people have had the idea to refuel satellites for decades. Gotcha. Often they'll think about refueling the upper stage of the rocket because a lot of that fuel that gets launched is used to get to the operational orbit. Mm-hmm. And so you could just refuel the upper stage to get there. But then a lot of that fuel is also just used operationally in orbit. Right, for the and t- so, yeah. adjusts. Yeah, because otherwise you drift away. Like the moon has gravity and the sun and the earth is lumpy and there's nothing to grab onto. So you just kind of right. slide out of position. Like you, You're no longer in sync. Yeah. Every Every month they'll typically like bump the satellite go back into the box, mm. drift to the other side of the box, you bump it the other way, drifts across <laughs> again. Yeah, about every month. Well, and, uh, and so they just, they just keep burning up fuel. You have to, well, either throw them out when they run out of fuel, which is what we do today, mm-hmm. or figure out how to refuel. So people have had that idea. Mm-hmm. But, and we've actually done it. We huh. have done refueling of space stations. Okay. We do transfer fuel to space stations. Gotcha. And what's different there? They have a human driving in to do the connection. And then they started to build, you know, the, the Russians built the cores system and it's like, okay. it's, there's automated systems now that can do that docking, but it's a very controlled thing. There are people like waiting on the button. The Russians quite often cancel it and go in and do it manually. In huh. fact, the, there was an incident where a Russian resupply vehicle actually ran into the Mir space station because they were testing cores on an automatic docking. 
That's right. And so then it, like, it kind of spun it, right? Well, it, it put a dent in it. Ooh. It was bad. Ow. Um, yeah, thankfully, they didn't have to evacuate or anything. They were able to fix the thing up, but it was touch and go. Yeah. So it's tricky. But what we want is a fully automated system with no humans in the loop. Yeah. Like how do we resupply that? So DARPA and NASA have both done uh, experiments and tests. The space station uh, dockings and approaches have all helped. We've built up this body of knowledge of what not to do by <laughs> making mistakes like cores, right? Sure. We've thought about how to approach. We've done a lot more modeling. The tools to do modeling, of course, have got a lot better. And what we're able now to do is to build self-driving spacecraft. Right? We have self-driving cars on the ground. That tech doesn't doesn't hurt either, right? That's true. And so now we have the ability to make self-driving spacecraft that are capable of doing docking. Yeah. And we have confidence that we can do that as a project. The next step okay. is to be able to do that as a product. Tracking, so, tracking. Interestingly, 20 years ago, if you wanted to point a spacecraft, that was very well known. Hmm. But it was a project. To point a spacecraft. Yeah, just to keep it pointed, right? Okay, you have to I design see. attitude control, it's called in the industry. Yeah, yeah, you have yeah. to design your attitude control system by buying the parts, doing the math, everything. Mm -hmm. And then, at least for smaller satellites, a few people started releasing attitude control in a box. Okay. Keep your spacecraft happy. <laughs> <laughs> but now that's a, that's a mature product. Yeah. And even for larger uh, spacecraft, you buy the attitude control in a box, the sensors, the algorithms, maybe the actuators as you get bigger are separate, okay. but it's now productized. Gotcha. We need that for rendezvous and docking. If we want a bustling in space economy, mm -hmm. we want things that can cooperate in orbit. We're now at that threshold. So yeah. when we started OrbitFab four and a half years ago, hmm. there were eight companies working on satellite servicing, to tow trucks in space. Yeah, yeah. And they could cooperate, they could repair spacecraft, they could refuel them perhaps, they could uh, move them between orbits. There are, there are several different business models. Basically, they could be tow trucks in space. Yeah, that was their vision. That's Had, right. Hadn't yet accomplished it yet. But. No, only, only these, these DARPA and NASA projects had really seriously tried it. Okay. Uh, but there were eight companies that were saying, hey, the, the tech is getting there. Hmm. We can work on this now. There are now 110 companies. Because everybody's realized how much of a fundamental change it makes. Wow. Because if your solar array is stuck, you really just wish you had a finger to poke it. Yeah. Right? You just, you wish you had a camera to take a photo of it to find out what's going wrong. Right. These things haven't existed, yeah. let alone refueling. Okay. And so for us, the idea that you could put a tow truck up, that's great because they're going to use a lot of fuel. Mm. And the business model, astoundingly, is to launch a tow truck, tow one or two satellites, and then throw the tow truck away because you're out of fuel. <sighs> Can you imagine doing that like on the on, on Earth? Every, Had, every time you need to get a tow and you call AAA, they build you a tow truck, especially to come and tow your car. Oh my gosh. That wouldn't work. The amazing thing in space is that it's actually beneficial to do that. Huh. You can close a business case doing that. Because it's so expensive. Because it's so expensive to operate. If we want to drive the cost of operating down, if we want a bustling in space economy, we've really got to drive the cost down a long way. Guaranteed. As soon as you can refuel that tow truck, they become reusable. Tracking. Everything changes dramatically. That's mm. what we want to enable. I love that. Yeah, to imagine Ted's towing company has has to get new new tow trucks every three every three cycles. Yeah, Ted's towing company is a production line of tow trucks more oh, than it gosh. is a towing company. Yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah. In regards to the uh just the the idea of in space servicing, you know, as a whole <sighs> I remember uh, just probably three or four years ago, I first like, you know, was, was fell in love with space a while ago, but like had a few pickles, a few pennies to scrape together. I was like, I want to invest. And I looked around and Maxar Technology was a company that at that time had just gone. I don't think they went bankrupt. But they were like skinny their teeth. They got and the reason their stock went from 55, 53 down to like six bucks. Yeah. Because they put all of their investments into Earthview 3 or some name like that. Massive bus size satellite. They launch it up there and the gyroscope fails. And no one can come fix it. And it was like a two, five hundred billion dollar ride up. So something ridiculous on their ledge. It was like, well, this hurts. They couldn't hire anyone to come out there and fix the gyros. Yeah. So there's a totally makes sense that there's been a a drawing in of those servicing different models regarding like okay fuel to refuel 
fuel to, to make attitude adjustments. Um, on average, like what is the, the current makeup of those satellites? Is it just hydrogen? Is it uh, mono, other monopropellants? What do they look like on average? Yeah, the, the typical fueling that, that's used at the moment, the fuels are, are hydrazine and xenon. Those are the okay. favorite fuels. It's about 70% hydrazine and, and 30% xenon. Uh, SpaceX have changed that a bit because they're using Krypton. Hmm. And the price of xenon has gone through the roof because, well, Russia invaded Ukraine. Ah. And so there was a bunch of supply there that all of, because, all of a sudden became inaccessible. It's a yeah. very limited supply hmm. because of how it's produced. Uh, but the demand is is still there from spacecraft, and there have been more spacecraft being launched. Uh, sure. They also use it for, for silicon chip manufacturing. Oh, wow. And so the price has gone through the roof, Yeah. Uh, which is a bit of a pain. And so people are looking at different fuels. And that but, was xenon, right? That's xenon, yeah. Okay. But the, there's a lot of flight heritage with the xenon thrusters, and, and no one really has a krypton thruster with flight heritage. Mm -hmm. uh, and so everyone's having to, to redevelop these things. Uh, so as it stands, people want hydrazine and xenon. Those are the, the two main fuels. And they're thinking about other things. Okay. What else are they thinking about? Like that here talked about green propellants and how that has some benefits and maybe it has a lower ISP of power per gram of fuel for those out there. Yeah, there's there's sort of two classes of thrusters. Okay. One is is the electric propulsion thrusters. And you might think, well, why don't we have electric powered satellites? Why do you need fuel? It turns out Newton said you need an equal and opposite reaction if you want an action, right? Uh, what a guy. And so in a Tesla, you push the accelerator and you push against the earth. And your ears touch behind your head. It, Teslas can be pretty good. Okay. The earth is a nice and big mass to push against. Yeah. In space, there's no earth to push against. So you have to take some with you. Yep. So that's, that's why you need propellant even when you have electric propulsion. But okay. then if you... Uh, if you want to move a long way with a small amount of propellant, mm -hmm. you want to throw that propellant out the back as fast as possible. Right. So electric propulsion systems, they ionize the propellant mm -hmm. and then they electrostatically accelerate it. It's like having a particle accelerator oh. attached to your spacecraft. That's what electric propulsion thrusters are. They're particle accelerators. And wow. so they get pretty damn good fuel efficiency. Yeah. But you need to take some xenon. They're still fuel limited. You okay. still run out of xenon, your mission is done. Yeah. And that's it. The other class of propellants are for going quickly. Okay. So, Long distance going quickly. Right. Two types of fuel. And so to go electric propulsion thrusters, you gather, gather energy from the sun and you slowly put that into the fuel and you bleed the fuel out very slow. It's very slow thrust, hmm. but you build up speed over a long period of time. Yeah. You can go extremely fast. Nice. But if you want to go quickly... You want the energy not to be coming from the sun and collected by big, heavy solar rays. You want that energy stored chemically and then mm. release it very quickly. That's a chemical thruster. Gotcha. And so that's the other class. And mm -hmm. so the chemical thrusters, they should have good energy density and they should have a very light molecule mass mm. so that when those molecules, like the, well, after it's burned, those molecules go out the back really quickly. And the lighter the molecules are the far, uh, and the more energy there was, the faster the exhaust velocity the better your fuel efficiency. The so you get, you get okay fuel efficiency out of a, a chemical thruster with a really good chemical. Yeah. One of the best chemicals is hydrazine. Hmm. It's made of nitrogen and hydrogen. And the, the thrust comes out at, you know, what is that, uh, three kilometers per second? All right. Compared to yeah. 20 kilometers per second for the best electric propulsion thrusters. Okay. So there's a big difference. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But still, three kilometers per second is, is nice and quick. Okay. And so that's that's what we're uh, we're looking at from the chemical thrusters. The problem with hydrazine, though, mm -hmm. is that it's also very very toxic. Gotcha. Uh, very toxic. Yeah. So the Europeans want to ban the use of hydrazine, hmm. uh, and everybody else just has to deal with that tech, uh, that toxicity, and make sure that you don't splash it on anybody. So you wear they call them scape suits. Oh, They're basically gosh. like wearing a spacesuit yeah. inside the payload area when you fuel up your satellite. Wow. And so that's that's why everybody's thinking, well, let's go to less toxic fuels. It'll save money on the ground preparation. It'll save money on the fuel handling. That's going to be a better way to go. So when people say green propellants, what they mean is not as toxic as hydrazine. Not as toxic. And there are a few that are being used. And of course, the, the Europeans now wanting to move away from hydrazine completely are mm -hmm. investing in some of these fuel technologies. Is it... Okay, so if it's, it's dangerous upon like fueling the port or whatever... Um, but once you get it in your spacecraft and you launch it up there, 
it's being just released into the void of space. Mm -hmm. So we don't really have any concern of toxicity once it's in space, right? Because space is a pretty big bathtub up there. So the main toxicity element is in the fueling. Is it also like in the creation of hydrazine? Is it one of like, um, like electric car batteries? Are they, there's some negative effects in the creation of that? There, there are some, um, okay. but that, that's manageable and, and, and not too bad. Gotcha. Uh, you just don't want to lease, release large amounts of, of hydrazine. Um, yeah. But thankfully, it also breaks down. So if you have okay. it in space and it hits the top of the atmosphere, it's colliding with the atoms in the top of the atmosphere so quickly it just breaks up the hydrazine. And it breaks up into nitrogen and hydrogen. So it, that's it, not too much of a problem. If it, yeah. if it hangs around in space, there's UV light up there, and that'll break it up as well. So okay. no, it's, it's not a concern at all if it's in space. Gotcha. The concern is if it's on the ground, if it yeah. seep, seep, uh, seeps into the ground, right. and then it takes a while to break down, it can remain toxic for quite a while. Okay. So just on the ground, we've got to be really careful about it. Yeah, and not only especially careful. Especially around people. Yeah, but but if the, it makes sense on the cost, right? You're trying to produce 10,000 satellites. And one yeah. of them, you can take a hose from an oxygen, you know, cooled down tank and just plug it in with gloves and that's it. And another one has to have a whole clean room, a big suit, yep. ventilators, different cost structure there for sure. Yeah. Okay. What's the validity, in your opinion, of like metal propellants for, I, I've heard it in two cases, for, for long-term travel as well as for the, the short attitude adjusters. Are there some pros? Are there some cons versus you know, some of the best liquid propellants? Yeah, de definitely pros and cons. Um, the, the propulsion trade space has mm -hmm. a lot of different variables. So fuel yeah. efficiency is one. Okay. And that's often like everyone holds that up and says, I've got a higher ISP, a specific impulse. It's yeah. the, the rocket scientist's measure of fuel efficiency. Yeah, miles per gallon. Basically means my fuel goes out the back faster. Yep. Okay. <laughs> it's what it boils down to, exhaust velocity. Um, but that fuel efficiency isn't everything, right? Mm. You've also got to, it's not just the, the weight of fuel that you have to lift that you're paying for. You also have to pay for all the equipment that goes along with it. How big are the solar arrays that are needed to get that electricity? How big is the battery, perhaps, that you need to, to release that electricity quickly? Yeah. How complicated is the thruster that you need to take? And that can be quite a lot. How toxic are the fuels? Sure. That can matter. Um, but some of the, uh, the interesting things with metal, they have an excellent storage density. Sure. It's, so it's metal. It's, it's very compact. Yeah. Whereas hydrogen has a storage density that's close to zero. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> even when you make liquid hydrogen, it's wow. like... 10% of the density of water. Whoa. Whereas you know, the best metals are 20 times the density of water. Yeah. So you're talking a couple of orders of magnitude difference. Okay. So that's why, that's one it's of the reasons, benefit. yeah, it's one of the reasons metals are interesting. Mm -hmm. But then if you don't ionize all the, the particles when you spray them out the back, and mm -hmm. always you'll get some neutralization happening in that stream, they okay. then kind of hang around the spacecraft as a cloud of metal. Mm. And they'll condense onto the coldest things, which are typically your optics and your solar rays. Oh, and that's not so good. This is also good. And maybe they create conductive shorts between any exposed electrical conductors. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of things you just got to be very careful about yeah. in how you design the thrusters, how you use the thrusters, what you expect as the result. Okay. Uh, and so that it depends what you're trying to get out of it. Yeah. Do you want low thrust? You get electric propulsion. Do you want high thrust? Because time is money. Hmm. Um, there's also orbital mechanics effects where if you're trying to go into planetary, you mm -hmm. can take electric propulsion. And you can go a lot further, a lot faster with yeah. the set amount of fuel. But there's a, a feature where if you come low to a gravity well, you get this, uh, this effect called the Oberth effect, where the faster you're traveling when you hit the accelerator, the faster you go coming out. The faster you, okay. It's like this, squared, yeah, it's like this squared effect though. So huh. you should be going as fast as possible when you add more speed. Huh. And then you'll get more bang for your buck. Huh. But if an electric propulsion system, it's accelerating very slowly. Your thrust is spread out over a very long time. Whereas a chemical thruster, you can burn right at the bottom and hit yeah. it really hard. And you'll get that much more. So if you're doing oh, gravity assist maneuvers. You really want combustion. You want high thrust. And actually wow. that trades off against the fuel efficiency. Because now fuel efficiency means something very different. So this very complex trade space. And okay. when you put into that the possibility of refueling mm -hmm. versus 
taking another module and replacing a module of some metal thruster that can't be pumped? Or do you heat it up so that the metal becomes liquid and you can pump? So many features go into that. Yeah. So when, when we look at this, there's one long term. Mm -hmm. It's actually a really interesting factor for us, which is, can you get that material from asteroids or the moon mm. to make a supply chain in space that doesn't have to get lifted from the ground? Right. That one gets really interesting. Okay. So let's, so let's jump into that because we, we you know, xenon, we, we don't want to continue with that. There's no, there's no xenon on the asteroids of the moon. Yeah. Right? It'd be great if it was, right? Let's sure. go and mine it. But when the sun ignited, hmm. because... Uh, all of a sudden there was a solar wind pushed a lot of light things out to the outer outer solar system and that's why the rocky planets are on the on the inside because the, the metals mm. and metal oxides and those kind of things they they condense and they're heavy and they just weren't pushed out by the wind but light things were pushed out so the outer solar system has all of the helium uh, and all of the hydrogen gotcha. and 99 percent of of the the nebula that made the sun was hydrogen and helium <laughs> and the inner solar system has almost none of it which tells you how strong that wind was over over a lot of time, right? Yeah. And so what we're left with are things that condense into solids, okay. which is things that combine with oxygen and, <laughs> and to form solids are what our planets are made of. Aluminum oxide, silicates, yeah. right? These are, these are what planets are made of. Metals that then condense and sink to the core. Hmm. Uh, but we also get hydrogen, oxygen as water, okay. which people theorize may have come back to the inner solar system from comets. Sure, sure. So there's, there's, there is hydrogen around mainly because of how abundant, how yeah. frightfully abundant it is in, this, in the, the, the universe, right? Mm. There's more hydrogen than everything else put together and then some. <laughs> it's a staggering amount of hydrogen. Basically, okay. the universe consists of hydrogen and some dust. And some other little things. <laughs> yeah. And so there's hydrogen around enough to make water and, and be able to get that. Okay. So on the asteroids and the moon, we find hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. Those are the volatiles. Hmm. It's that and metals and silicates. Okay. And so you'll leave the metals and the silicates to the guys that want to build space infrastructure, the big habitats, etc. Those guys can mine that kind of stuff. Maybe you guys can be friends, give them fuel. But in the meantime, you said, so, okay, so comets are coming back. Mm -hmm. Those have a lot of the water. We know the moon has a decent amount. We still don't know how much. We're going to find yeah. out sooner enough. Um, I guess walk us through the the vision there of orbit fab. So if start start from start from that that ten fifteen, like what what impact do you guys want to have? You can't predict the future, but what's the impact you guys want to have to get us to that bustling in space? Yeah, our vision is a bustling in space economy. Yeah, right? our mission is to be the materials supply chain. Okay, okay. We don't want to be a mining company. We're not extractive. We want to be a midstream and downstream chemicals company. So we're just going to start with downstream, logistics, delivery. That's what we do now. Launch fuel from the ground, gotcha. deliver it. Provide the fueling ports, the technology, the pumping, mm -hmm. um, help with the docking kits, anything that's needed for just being able to get fuel available to our customers. Okay. That's cool. And then we move beyond fuel to materials. Hmm. And we move beyond just logistics to processing and manufacturing. Okay. And so we want to be buying the material from the moon and mine and asteroid mining companies. Yeah. And be the entire chemical processing and delivery. Gotcha. Okay. You take the raw ice or the the silicate volatiles where it's got silicon and some other oxygen bound to it for some weird chemical reactions that I don't understand but I trust and take it from dirty moon rocks into fuel for for vessels as well as Fuel for your space car. Fuel for your space car. Okay, love it. So oxygen, right? That's one of the the highest ISP fuels out there. Like, I guess talk to us a little bit about what that would mean of a, an economy actually run on oxygen and hydrogen versus current methods. So, fuel is a is a precarious word. Um, okay. Fuel requires an oxidizer, right? Gasoline you burn with air. Sure. Right. Hydrogen is a fuel. Oxygen is the oxidizer. You burn the two together. Oxygen isn't a fuel. You can't burn that in air. Okay. That doesn't work, but it's a massive accelerant. <laughs> right. Gotcha. And, and you need it to, to form combustion. So when you look at chemical uh, propulsion, typically there's a fuel and an oxidizer. Sometimes like hydrazine, it just decomposes naturally because it's such an unstable chemical. Okay. One of the reasons it's probably dangerous is because it likes to decompose in nasty ways. Sure. But... Um, 
but that you know that energy density and that chemical likes to decompose itself. Um, unfortunately, we look at hydrazine. Hydro hydrazine, it's got uh, hydrogen and nitrogen molecules uh, atoms in it. Right, right. it's N two H four. Okay, nitrogen likes to form N two, a nice stable gas which mm. is very light, which was then blown to the outer solar system. Okay. So okay. there's very very little nitrogen in the inner solar system, except at the bottom of very deep gravity wells like Earth. Hey, and then okay. you've got to put it on rockets to get it out, which is a pain in the neck. Yeah, so yeah. asteroids in the moon, not much nitrogen. We're back okay. to carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Okay. And so when we look to the future of, of fuels, we look at those three elements and say, well, how do we make an oxidizer hmm. and a propellant and a, and a fuel mm -hmm. out of those three elements that is storable so that we don't have to keep it at cryogenic temperatures? So you talk about oxygen yeah. and hydrogen. If you want to burn those two together, hmm. they're very, very much not dense. They store as gases at standard temperatures. Right? Right. You have to cool them down to be liquid. Liquid hydrogen is 20 degrees Kelvin. It's 20 degrees above absolute zero. It's a little cold. It's terrifyingly cold. <laughs> it would freeze your hand off real quick. Um, and, and while you might be able to store it at the bottom of a crater on the, on the moon, right. which isn't quite cold enough, they're about 40 Kelvin. Really? So you've got to bring the temperature down even further than that. Wow. To store liquid hydrogen. At the bottom of those permanently shadowed regions, yeah. haven't seen the sun in a billion years. Yep. They trap water. They won't trap hydrogen. Whoa. It's cold. Yeah. And so then in, for, for long-term storage in space, that's hard. Yeah. People have been working on that for 40 or 50 years, and they think they've figured out ways to get to zero boil off, right? It's not going to boil and evaporate and eventually disappear. Huh. But it's very complicated equipment. Okay. It's it's not yet operational, and it has a limited size, right? A lot of that stuff just requires bulk and the insulation thickness and how you shield yeah. from the sun and the earth because the earth is quite hot. When you think about those temperatures, sure, the earth sure. is insanely hot, right? Mm -hmm. And so you've got to have a massive amount of shielding. Okay. And you can't do a minimum viable product. You can't yeah. do a small spacecraft using liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. No, no chance. And the the other feature which which most people won't appreciate is you actually put more hydrogen into a rocket than you need to burn it with the oxygen to make thrust. Hmm. So there's a ratio called that? stoichiometric, okay. which is you know, two to one for water, right? It's H2O, right? Right. twice as much hydrogen and oxygen. Perfect. On a, on a mo molecule basis, okay. which still means there's a lot more weight in the oxygen because the oxygen atoms are much bigger, right? But molecule ratios, two to one is called stoichiometric. Everything will end up as water. Okay. Turns out if you put more hydrogen in, hmm. If that hydrogen will never burn, but it's so light, it's such a small molecule, that it will get some of that energy and it really takes off. Hmm. Because of the momentum and, and energy equations, you can you can sit down and do them. And it's it's sure, uh, sure. what grade eight or nine in, in high school will probably let you let okay. you do that math. Um, and Pop. you can calculate and realize, yeah, the hydrogen really comes out fast. Yeah, yeah. Just because it's so small. And so by increasing the dosage of hydrogen up to a point, you get a faster exhaust velocity, not a slower, hmm. even though it contributes no energy. It just lowers <laughs> the average um, molecular mass, which increases the exhaust velocity. Okay. And so they usually run them with like an, an eight to one ratio. Well, yeah. eight hydrogen to one oxygen. And that's what we've been doing on yeah. all of these rockets, all yeah. of these spacecraft up in the orbit. which works really well on the ground because you just pump them with those ratios and off you go and you can get an exhaust yeah. velocity of 400 and, uh, sorry 4.5 kilometers per second all right all compared right. to if you just burn the hydrogen and oxygen you get about 300 310 hmm. sorry isp so 3.1 uh, kilometers per second so okay. 4.5 compared to 3.1 it's a lot slower yeah, yeah yeah significantly if you burn hydrogen peroxide and hydrocarbons which mm. you can make and store you get a specific impulse of 320 seconds. So uh, exhaust velocity of, of 3.2 kilometers per second, so a little bit better, a little bit better. than stoichiometric hydrogen oxygen. Ah, now, what this, what this means on Earth is, is irrelevant because just make extra hydrogen. Sure, sure. But if you're operating a mine on the moon or something like that, are you just going to throw away all that extra oxygen you ended up when you took water and split it? Hmm. Like, where does the extra hydrogen come from? Yeah. So that doesn't make sense in the mining operation. Okay, so... So going to that, so just it's OH. Um, I just you just said it, hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide, hydrogen H peroxide, H two O two. Okay, H two O two, the stuff in little brown bottles that you put on your cut yeah. and scrape. Yeah, it's it's great for sterilizing things. That's yeah. like 
five percent, maybe three percent concentration. Okay. If you concentrate that up to ninety percent, mm -hmm. it's very aggressively oxidized, <laughs> like dangerous. It's rocket fuel. Okay. Right? Yeah. It really is. Don't let it touch your skin. Yeah. It's, there are people who have accidentally put their foot in a bucket of this. This is one one accident report, and well. their trousers just caught on fire spontaneously. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Just because it reacted, how does that even happen with the chemistry of it? Well, it's it's the hydrogen and oxygen. Like the, the oxygen in that peroxide is trying to get off. And okay. it meets something like your trousers, which have carbon in them. It's a linen. Uh, and it just burns straight away. Fascinating. Boom. Yeah. So the guy jumped out of the bucket and got rid of his trousers. And I think he was okay. All right. But don't do that. Don't do that. It's not a good day. <laughs> okay. So, so you said the combination of hydrogen peroxide and then also hydrocarbons. I think of carbon as, you know, apparently we're we're made of it. Oh, that's a heavy percentage of what we are, as well as diamonds and graphite, graphene. That's about the only, you know, knowledge base I have of like things that are very heavy carbon rich. Mm -hmm. I don't think of any of those as a, a fuel source. So what's the what's the addition to that that makes it really well, be able to burn? Hydrocarbons of course also include gasoline. Okay. Yeah. Rocket fuel, kerosene, RP1. Carbon mixed with it's, a long chain it's of... It's a chain of carbon with a bunch of hydrogen on it. I see, I see. it burns with oxygen to make water and carbon dioxide. Okay. Okay, so asteroids, probably the near-Earth ones, and then also out in the belt. Main volatiles that you guys are interested, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. That's it. Oxygen and hydrogen, combine that into what we said, hydrogen peroxide. Do you foresee a future of like two different main fuel sources when we're out there still of one a slow burn and one the, the really fast accelerant uh, between like the the mono propellant of hydrogen peroxide and something creative that you build with the with the carbon and the hydrogen up there on those asteroids? Yeah, we we're, we're still looking at that. Right? We we've okay. mapped out possibilities and options for how we build that chemical production system sure. in, in space. And making hydrogen peroxide, it's an excellent oxidizer. It's also a decent monopropellant. So it mm, will decompose yeah. on a catalyst and you get a, a good thrust just out of that. Okay. Uh, but more fuel efficient if you burn it with a hydrocarbon or something. Or burning it with that. Okay. That's right. I um, see. But it's, it's not as fuel efficient as an electric propulsion system. The trick is that we don't know what materials might make a good electric propulsion system that we can mine from an asteroid. Anything with oxygen that you use, like water, mm -hmm. the oxygen will turn into atomic oxygen as you ionize it in, a, in an electric propulsion system, okay. and that will eat your thruster. Everything gets eaten by atomic oxygen. Okay, wait, I'm very unfamiliar with atomic oxygen. That's, what's, that's what's, good because then you're <laughs> <laughs> I'm still here. I'm yeah. alive. Um, atomic, if you take an oxygen molecule and split it in half, you've got atomic oxygen. It does not want to stay like that. Ah, O2, will, just the O. It will react with everything, including more oxygen to form molecular oxygen gotcha. right but it will also react with a spacecraft to turn it into well not a spacecraft <laughs> roger that okay yeah. and, oxygen and, hits steel and it makes something iron, iron oxide yeah rust you yeah. don't want that in space it's, it's actually interesting in the at the top of the atmosphere in low earth orbit mm -hmm. the the oxygen molecules that are bouncing around the top of the atmosphere often get hit by uv light and mm -hmm. it turns into atom atomic oxygen so a lot of the plasma environment at low earth orbit is atomic oxygen Ooh. And that's why we put cover glass on the solar cells and we passivate like that. Everything gets gets passivated and protected hmm. because otherwise the atomic oxygen can eat through things and definitely discolors surfaces and uh, and create surface damage. How quickly does that happen? Like, Well, that depends on how good you are at passivating. It. <laughs> if you do the right things, you can last a very long time without deteriorating. But if you have a high amount of atomic oxygen, especially at high temperatures, okay. as you would in, a, in an electric thruster, Sure. Then it will eat through the thruster a little more quickly than you would like. A okay. lot more quickly than you would like. Okay. So my brain actually went, actually not even to spacecraft, but what was the, the Red Bull guy that went up to 60 kilometers? Probably wasn't oh, even Felix, that high. Oh, Felix, yeah. He, uh, he but, jumped out of the high, high altitude balloon. Yeah. So he probably wasn't high enough to, to interact with a ton of atomic oxygen. But if you got, I don't know dropped from the ISS. I get that there's some, <laughs> there's some physics problems in there, I'm sure. You've got other problems. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. You get a little, a little toasty in there. Yeah. Uh, so so I, I know of one satellite 
that got launched into low Earth orbit. And they were moving very quickly to launch this spacecraft. It's quite a number of years ago. Okay. Um, they had a very cheap uh, launch opportunity. And they didn't have time to put the cover glass on their solar cells. Hmm. So they thought, oh, we'll just launch them anyway, silicon solar cells. They lasted a month. Wow. And then they were not producing enough power to run the spacecraft. Wow. Just because of the time that they went through the atmosphere or well, no, in low Earth? That's being in low Earth orbit, even uh, out at like yeah. 600 kilometers. You still touch the atmosphere. That's what slows you down. Yeah. There's a few atoms of atomic oxygen traveling at high speeds. Wow. They lasted and a month. It was a month and then they ran out of power. Okay. So there you go, kitties. Always put cover glass on your solar cells. There it is. <laughs> there it is. And that's just like a, a film kind of thing that you over top or oh, like a, the, literal glass? The cover glass is like fused silica Ooh. and it's it's microns thick. Gotcha. Like you just need a thin layer. So uh -huh. you make it as thin as you can to make it light. Okay. Yeah. Track and then you there. glue it to the solar cell. Yeah, great sound effect for <laughs> gluing solar cells. <laughs> one of my many, one of my many skills. Okay, so you can use those things, those fuels, out in the deep to make a really efficient uh, chemical thruster yep. that has the potential to, you know, if you get a good ion engine out there. We still don't know too many details about the asteroids and what we could build with that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're sort of looking around and hunting around for electric propulsion propellants. Yeah. Uh, the metals are actually some of the interesting ones. Mm. And so perhaps somebody will mine an asteroid and pull out the metals, and we'll be able to refine that into fuel rods or melted down um, into, you know, cast into the, the thruster chambers or, or however they need to be provided. Gotcha. So we are looking at a, a diversity of options, um, mm -hmm. but that's that's a few years away. I, I, yeah. I'll remind you, right now we're a gas cap company, right, 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 with aspirations of being a gas station company. Fair, fair. Okay, well then let's get into more of if that's the vision, more of the strategy. We already talked about the tactics of Rafti. Hey, that's well, and actually, you guys took this design and like gave it to everyone or something to that effect. Tell, walk us through that. Yeah, basically. I and mean, when we started, we talked with you know, two, three dozen companies about what they might want, what it should look like, how it should perform, how to interface to it, yeah. all those types of things. Hold it a, a little, yeah. There we go. So when we, uh, after we'd done that, we built one and <laughs> we, uh, we showed it to, to people and they said, well, that's terrible. You, you did what I asked, not what I wanted. <laughs> and then we got new requirements. Right? Yep. And so we did that a couple of times. And then we flew, uh, we've flown our first operational fuel depot. That's been on orbit since last June. Okay. And that had two of these. And we fueled it in, on the ground. We, we did the fueling through the Rafty fueling port uh, in the SpaceX uh, payload processing facility okay. in, in Florida. And, uh, and so through that, we learned more. And it actually worked really well. The, the hmm. fuel is in the spacecraft. That was very, very successful. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, but we, we then got even more requirements from customers, people that said, oh, it's real. Give me another look, right? Hmm. Now let me think about how I put this on a spacecraft. Let me think about how it interacts with things. And so we went through another design revision. So yeah. this is block two. Okay, gotcha. um, which is about the fourth revision, <laughs> um, but okay. now we, we believe that it's, it's stabilizing. Uh, you know, everything's performing quite well in test, and and it's you know everything that we need in a, in the the user document and the like. Uh, yeah. And so we went to the community. One of one of the other things that they wanted was to know that we wouldn't lock up the supply, and and you know everyone decides they like it, it becomes a de facto standard, and yeah. and we can hold them over a barrel. We don't want to do that. We want a bustling space economy. Yeah, and. The, the fear that we might do that actually slows down adoption. Yeah, guaranteed. And so we do not want to slow down adoption. So we announced late last year that we're going to make this available under an open license. So gotcha. other companies can manufacture them and supply them. Mm -hmm. And then we're actually going to have a certification process. You know, we, can, we can give the, the test specification nice. and then check that it's been followed properly and certified. Okay, this will work with any of the refueling architecture, right? This mm -hmm. this will fit. That's a, a great way. We're not going to make a lot of money off that, right? Sure. Our goal is to sell fuel in space. This yeah. is this is how to make everybody compatible. So it's not a it's not a standard. Um, mm. Maybe it will be one day. Who knows? Maybe something gotcha. else. But it's now it's now a, a common interface that that's open and available under this open license. Okay, gotcha. So open license, others can manufacture it, but at current day, no one else has the capabilities machine wise. To probably manufacture it. Oh, people have the capabilities, but they they don't have they don't have the designs, the tests. They haven't gotcha. they haven't got flight heritage. No one's gone through the process of of trying to make it and figuring out all the little nuances yet. So okay. 
that's where you know, if we share the design, then people can do that. Yeah. So we'll share the requirements, the specifications, the option of sharing the design, the test requirements, and to certify that it was done correctly and works with our system. Tracking. Okay, so in seven, eight years from now, if this is successful, we got a bustling space economy and, yep. you know, you guys are Orbit Fab, so uh, Joe Fab, Bill Fab, <laughs> they think that they can make this specific part cheaper and more reliable. They yep. may go ahead and try to do that. And now there's two providers of the Rafti port, but they're both tested, both the same. Sure. That's right. And, and we don't actually want to spool up a, a large capacity production facility. Okay. Right. Okay. So we'd actually prefer that when we get an yeah. order for 5,000 of these, that we can pass that order on to somebody else. Nice. But we always want to be able to produce a small quantity so yeah. that we can do tests, right? If there's other equipment we want to design around this, uh, sure. we've got the ability to, to make small batches. So that's that's our goal. Make small batches, get other people to make them in quantity. Okay. that's Yeah, that's a really interesting approach there. So if you don't want to manufacture these in large scale, uh, I've seen some beautiful graphics out here uh, at your facility in Denver. What do you guys want to manufacture? Like, describe to me these. You have the one full fuel. Blah, blah. You have the one fueling station that's already been up on on orbit. What was the name of that one? Uh, we put up two to the International Space Station. Those test beds were called the Furfy Mission. Okay. And then we uh, we have one operational fuel depot called Tenzing. Okay, gotcha. So Tenzin went up there, and the Tenzin is that just the test demo, or is that like the the full production version that you guys want to start cranking out? No, Tenzing was our minimum viable product, if you like, right? It was okay. it was testing that that we could do the fueling on the ground, that mm -hmm. we could carry. In this case, we actually carried hydrogen peroxide. Oh, nice. It's a, it's a good stepping stone between water, which is pretty inert, yeah. and uh, and hydrazine, which is both aggressive and toxic. Yeah. Hydrogen so peroxide in high concentration is aggressive, but not toxic. Okay, and okay. So that's a good distinction. We, we then use that as the stepping stone. It's also part of our longer-term vision, of course. One day we want to be manufacturing peroxide in orbit. Guaranteed. So it, it sort of throws that... Uh, uh, that hook over the uh, over the the wall. Gotcha. But yeah. uh, locks you in. But the next step is to to launch our hydrazine systems. Okay. Yep. Okay. So those hydrazine systems, those are ones when you Google Orbit Fab, there's this like hexapod image that looks gorgeous. <laughs> Talk to us about that. Is that going to be just stationed in Leo or all the way out to geostationary orbit? Uh, I guess where's the position and who do you see as first customers for that one? So we've got customers that want to buy fuel in both geostationary orbit and low Earth orbit. Okay. We have customers that want fuel in mid-Earth orbits and cislunar as well. Hmm. But most of them are in geo and, and, and Leo. Okay. And so we've done this statistical map of where the customers are, which fuels they use, how much they use, how long they last with the fuel. Uh, and, and that's sort of historic data. But then more interestingly, forward forecast data, of course. Sure. Uh, and then designed around that... Uh, a distribution pattern of where we should put both our fuel depots, which are the, the big tanks of fuel that we put up as cheap as possible, and our fuel shuttles, which take the fuel from the depot to an operational satellite. So gotcha. we'll have a network of depots and shuttles that allow us to have a relatively short delivery time between an order and an executing delivery. Okay. And so there's trade-offs between time and amount of fuel used in our own operations and all these types of things. It makes it a pretty complex, complex okay. calculation. Okay, so you've already had a demo in space. And then the, the Tenzin spacecraft, which is this kind of like that yeah, one? Yeah, that, that's a model. Grab that and, and hold it up. So this is... It's a, it's a bit bigger than this one, to be honest. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but this is a, a model of, of Tenzin, the first operational fuel depot that we launched. It's June last year, so it's been in orbit more than a year now. Wow. Uh, it's got two of the, the fueling ports. And, yes. uh, and so... Oh, and apparently it breaks if you're not careful. <laughs> yeah, we put, a, paper we put a lot of technology into this. So it's not just got the, the fuel tank inside. There's a thruster here that we wanted to test, one hmm. of these hydrogen peroxide thrusters. Gotcha. And uh, we actually have two cameras on this side that um, we we were testing them out for our rendezvous and docking activities. Sure. But uh, we partnered with Scout, who hmm. want to do inspection satellites in orbit which is an aspect of satellite servicing. It's super interesting. No one's ever been able to do damage assessments, failure assessments, just oh. any kind of assessments of anything in orbit because you couldn't get photos of them. Sure. So they're floating around out there and no one knows exactly what's happened with them. Huh. You're always guessing from like a little bit of telemetry. Gotcha. So they're like, yeah, we can just fly up and take photos of them. So they, they got to test the cameras. They happened to be the same cameras that we wanted for rendezvous docking. So that was pretty cool. So Perfect. we put a lot, of, a lot of stuff into this box. Yeah. And then... Um, yeah, this, this carried hydrogen peroxide and it's been operating for, for more than a year. 
Okay. And had, you said, three gallons worth of hydrogen peroxide, or was that the previous version? We put three gallons of water on the International Space Station. Okay. Yeah, this this one, and it's it's less than 50 kilos. It's not a particularly big uh, store. It's, it's a minimum viable product. Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah. And then that has refueled just the, the test examples? Um, like what... So for, what activities has that taken place in? So for this one, we fueled it on the ground using the rafty fueling port. Right? This is the, sure. the fueling port. We, we actually got to test that. So um, we went to, to Florida to the SpaceX facility mm-hmm. and, uh, and did the payload preparation there. So we, we plugged that in and, uh, and put fuel into the, the spacecraft using that. Uh, and that got us a, a lot of testing, um, sure. you know, a lot of great feedback. We learned a lot from doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, it worked very well, which was good doesn't mean we couldn't improve it Uh, and that's exactly why we did it right it was rapid iteration minimum viable product get it to orbit and make sure that it behaves correctly and learn as fast as we can and so similarly we put hydrogen peroxide in this one Mm -hmm. whereas the test of the space station had water okay and and while water is nice and inert hydrogen peroxide is a a very aggressive oxidizer Mm -hmm. and so you have to be very careful it will go kaboom if you don't treat it right (laughs) sure but what our customers really want is hydrazine and hydrazine uh, is both kaboomable, it's a very aggressive reducing agent in this case, kaboomable. and it's very, very toxic. Yeah. And so this is our stepping stone to, to hydrazine systems, which is what we're going to launch next. Gotcha. Okay, so you launch it up there and you make sure that there aren't any leaks in... Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Toss it. <laughs> toss it on the table. You launch it up there and make sure, okay, well, this was good uh, on Earth, but now we're up in space with basically zero G. You know, how does it behave you and, and just test and make sure there aren't any random leaks that the the cameras that you were saying that Scout put in, make sure all those elements work. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And then our architecture is to have fuel depots, so mm-hmm. big, cheap tanks of fuel that we okay. can launch on, on any available rocket and do that cost effectively. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then fuel shuttles, we can, can take that fuel from the depot and deliver it to an operational satellite. Gotcha. And the fuel shuttles have all the smarts, the active parts, and, yeah. and that's the next step. That's what we're building now. Okay, and the fuel shuttles, that's the, the version two or version three of Tenzing, the fully operational one, maybe a little bigger. Now, Tenzing is a, a depot. Oh, so okay, it, it doesn't have the active elements. Gotcha. So the depots and shuttles. So it's a, it's a miniature version of the depots. Okay. And we'll eventually be launching quite a few depots. That, that's how we get a lot of the fuel up. And yeah. the fuel shuttles, they're effectively reusable. They use some of the fuel they collect to do their operations. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. So I guess, yeah, I got, I got tripped up there because I've seen the concept arps of the, I guess, the stage three depot and the stage four depot, which we can talk about in just a second. Um, but okay. And then the active one that's flying to this depot, Tenzin, picking up the fuel, that's the one that has those grabbable arms. That's right, yeah. Okay, tracking. So, yeah, talk to me about those those second stage, those third stage fuel depots. If this was a, a stepping stone before we get to the really difficult hydrazine scary stuff, what do those bigger ones look like? And, you know, are, are there is there government interest on these bigger buses of fuel or is it just a few other random companies that say, yeah, that would be nice? Yeah, absolutely. There's interest. We, we built a big statistical model of the populations of satellites on orbit. So mm-hmm. low Earth orbit and geostationary orbit are where we see the most demand. We've also get requests for mid-Earth orbits and cislunar space, but it's not there yet. Not as much as, as the other two locations. So we're focusing on, on geostationary orbit and low Earth orbit. Okay. And so we, we have the statistical model of sort of past population, size of satellites, fuel they use, where they are. And uh, and we designed our network of fuel depots and and uh, fuel shuttles to be able to optimize sort of delivery times, uh, the amount of fuel that we use, the amount of capital we spend on building that out. So it's, it's a pretty optimized network and a complex calculation. But sure. that lets us then map that out. So with the, the fuel depots, the mm-hmm. biggest uh, sort of driver and input to how big we, we make those in the configuration sure. is the launch vehicles. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Whereas the fuel shuttles are designed to carry the right amount of fuel that our customers are going to need. Yeah. And so they're designed based on, again, these statistical models of, of customer sizes and frequency and everything. Okay. So there could probably be one launch or, so if you think of uh, some of the smaller scale rockets, maybe they're cheaper for you guys and you can just load a few of the, the shuttles in there up to orbit. But to get some of the bigger, hunkier fuel depots, maybe you have to rely on a SpaceX Starship or something to that effect of that size of class of rocket. 
yeah, if we can get a cheap ride for even just 100 kilos of fuel, why wouldn't we take it, right? Totally. Especially if there's like some space left in a rocket. Yeah. And sometimes that happens. In fact, very often that happens. Yeah. And so we're looking always for the cheapest ride so that we can pass that on to our customers. Like we've got to be able to deliver value. Uh, and then the, the fuel shuttles, they're infinitely reusable, right? That's, that's the goal. Right. And so we don't need to launch very many of those. We just okay. need to make sure that they're, they're mobile and they're maintained and they, they keep delivering fuel. Okay, fascinating. So the in recent months or so, I guess, maybe a, a more than a year, the Space Force and a couple other you know, big government projects, they've been really pushing towards space domain awareness uh, and also the building blocks of this bustling space economy. What's that partnership look like with either Space Force or other DOD groups on now, do they have a specific demand for these fuels up in orbit? Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're really leaning into this type of thing. Nice. It's, it's part of the future architectures. If you're in a contested environment, mobility wins. You yeah. have to be able yeah. to get out of the way. You have to be able to get to places and show up in places uh -huh. to, to be able to, to you know, do a, any any of the kinds of things that they need. So they've very much seen that this is this is critical, and they've backed us with quite a few contracts to nice. uh, get the fueling ports ready for their their spacecraft. Uh, we actually had both Lockheed and Northrop Grumman investing in Orbit Fab because they saw the interest that their customers have, wow. and they wanted to make sure they had guaranteed access to the technology. Okay. And so yeah. that's uh, that's been really helpful, and that they're companies that really know how to operate very sophisticated spacecraft and build very reliable spacecraft. So their inputs to our systems have been have have been great on the technical side. Yeah. And so that, that's helped us as well. So we're building that sort of ecosystem with the government. And their demand is, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. They, they want mobility. They want high, th high thrust. They don't want the electric propellants. <laughs> um, you know, they, they want to encourage availability. Uh, and so we are making that a, a part of our commercial offering is that, of course, we'll, we'll also sell to the U.S. government if the U.S. government wants to buy. Yeah. Uh, it hasn't derailed us or really changed our plans from what we what we were doing, which has been a great thing. We've managed to align nice. the contracts we've got from the U.S. government with exactly what we wanted to do on the commercial side. That's good, because that can be a real challenge, I've heard. Just as I've done this podcast, I've just been exposed to different companies out there named Y or named Z that almost pigeonhole themselves into just going after the SBRIs or, or, or some of those government contracts because it's money on the table, but then you can very quickly get derailed there. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be careful to say no to, to money, right? <laughs> it, it always comes with strings attached. Even if it's yeah. like it's a contract paying, they're not taking equity or what have you, but they're taking your time, right? Yeah. And your time is, is like, that's the fire in which we burn. Hmm. <laughs> you have to decide whether this is going to help you build the thing you want to build. And yeah. we're very focused, right? We want to build a busting in space economy. Yeah, and our mission is to do that by building the fuel supply. And if it doesn't help us build that fuel supply, we probably shouldn't be taking that money. Hmm. And so that's always been the focus of, of you know, how we've, we've set up this business and run the business. Gotcha. So, so talking more about the finance side, right? There's been, there's a lot of stats out there that show the growth of investment in the space sector in the past, well, two years for sure, but even before that, two, four, six, what's been the biggest like driver of financially why you see Orbit Fab succeeding where previous companies that you were part of just weren't able to? Is it just timing of the market or different product? How do you see that? Yeah, we, we got lucky in timing. Okay. And it's better to be lucky than smart. <laughs> Fair. I, we, okay. we got lucky. The, the, the technology is there. People are believing that the technology will succeed. Rendezvous and docking of spacecrafts autonomously in orbit. Yeah. That's that's the fundamental technology behind satellite servicing and refueling. Well, in, in SpaceX, they did that, right? On the first um, humans up to the International Space Station on their capsule, they did that autonomously. The, they do, but they get berthed. So they stand Fair. off just okay. a little way and they get grabbed by the arm. So it's uh, slightly different, but very, very similar in terms of the control systems and technology. Okay. Yeah. And you guys are doing without the extender, the bump, bump and grab. That's it. Yeah. Okay. So no robotic arms come in direct dock and, uh, you know, pr proving that on orbit, that's, that's our landing a rocket on a barge moment, <laughs> right? That is the point where everybody says, all right, this works now. Yeah. I am, I'm ready to commit. I want these systems. So you, big companies say you've got to prove it on orbit. For sure. Uh, and so that's where the government customers can be great because they will give you money up front. 
yeah, yeah. and in our case they want to achieve the same thing as the commercial folks do as, as we do and so they're paying for a lot of that up front but the right. big commercial companies they're going to come on board once we've proved it and they're they're pretty excited to see it happen okay got you there um so okay so i've been making those those steps and, and really you said just just timing there's been a lot of a lot of hype, a lot of interest in the satellite servicing and all parts of that just in the past two, four years versus before market just wasn't there. Well, like I mentioned, when we started, there were eight companies trying to do satellite servicing. Right. And that was because the technology had got to the point where it existed. But our biggest risk was that the satellite servicing market wouldn't find its feet. Hmm. And people were just in this paradigm. Right? We, we have one tank of fuel. That's all I need because that's all I ever get. Right? Yeah. I've designed around it. Therefore, I'm happy with it. Chicken but egg. the whole thing with a paradigm is once you see outside it and you realize that you're dropping all this money for fuel a year before you get to, to earning revenue <laughs> and you've paid for, what, 15 years worth of fuel on, on the low Earth orbit constellations. It's five years worth of fuel. You paid for that up front. Wow. If your market shifts, you're never going to see that money again. It's gone. Hmm. right you can't okay. you can't burn more fuel to get to a new market because you just cut years off the life of the satellite yeah. there's no flexibility in that and so people start to see that flexibility mm -hmm. you see the paradigm change right you see them them realize hey but i could shrink my fuel tanks and then i could shrink my actuators because my satellite's now lighter okay okay and now talk I can about fit, that. i can fit more of them on the same vehicle huh. and what if i launch with no fuel at all but twice as many transponders i can make twice as much money and you can give me fuel from the get-go. People start to redesign how they plan these things and everything starts to change. And what we've seen in the last five years is that people have come around to realizing this is inevitable and it's okay. going to happen and they have to be ready for it and it's a huge opportunity. Guaranteed. So I mean, if, if we can turn the, the current plans for, for constellations of tens of thousands of satellites and Greg Weiler's latest company, eSpace, they want to put 300,000 satellites. That's a few. I compare that to, to terrestrial to, uh, cell phones, right? How mm -hmm. many cell phone towers are there in the world? Oh, uh, a couple million? Mil millions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Millions. That's what we're going to have in space. Yeah. And when you upgrade from 4G to 5G on the ground, what, what do you do? Get new towers. No, you don't. You put a new transponder on an existing um, tower. Why would you destroy that infrastructure, right? Well, fair enough. Like you go and build another mountain to put another all tower right, all right, on. All right, fair enough. You climb up, you, you unscrew some bolts. That's and it. put it in. Satellite servicing lets us do that. Mm. We're going to see millions of cell phone towers in orbit. They're going to get upgraded constantly. Yeah. And so rather than having to spend $10 billion in five years deploying a constellation, you just launch a truckload of transponders. <laughs> you put them on the constellation. You have linear cost growth. You put them on however many towers you want. You rent the space on the towers. And your capital expenditure has gone down to, what, tens or hundreds of millions, and you're operational in a fraction of the time. The barrier to entry just got really, really low. And through doing that, space communications is going to win the $3 billion mobile comms market. Yeah. Did I say billion? Let me state that again. Three. Trillion. Global mobile communications is a $3 trillion business, and hmm. it will be won by these types of spacecraft. And these spacecraft... You can. Uh, they're so going to need a lot of fuel. They're going to need a lot of fuel. <laughs> I mean, when we saw that, we were talking about that before the show. Of Starlink has adjusted what was it seventeen thousand times um, because of the ASAT test. All these tiny little the, satellites moving. There was, there was a Russian anti-satellite test that that blew up a satellite. Thankfully, not in too high an orbit, so it's slowly, slowly degrading. Yeah. But even so, the SpaceX satellites. It was seventeen hundred times. Seventeen hundred. That had to maneuver out of the way of the debris, just caused by that that collision yeah that the, that well anti-satellite test right taking years off the life of some of those satellites once yeah that, it burns around. up that fuel you do not get that fuel back no not in it no spacecraft aren't equipped to be refueled when that fuel is gone so is the spacecraft like, okay. you can't coordinate it you can't keep it aligned they just all bunch up drift apart and it's even worse right the, hmm. these spacecraft sometimes they fail sometimes they, they run out of fuel like before you expect what have you it's like running out of gas in the middle of a freeway and walking away from the car and leaving <laughs> it there Everyone has to dodge it. Yeah. Right? That's what we're doing to space right now. You need to run a tow truck service. And why can't you run a tow truck service? Because you've got no fuel for the tow trucks. You can only use the tow truck twice. You can you only to... use the tow truck twice. Okay. This is the world we have to change, right? It's so yeah. obvious when you start thinking about it. For sure. So, so you, you talked about like just launching hundreds and hundreds of satellites even faster with 
with no fuel or barely any fuel up there and like well, just the transponders flush that idea out for me yeah that, that's one of the options right if yeah if you build an expensive piece of equipment mm-hmm. a, a satellite with a bunch of transponders you want that on orbit as quickly as possible because okay. that's money you sure. want it generating revenue mm-hmm. now for the geostationary orbit, they put them into a, a low Earth orbit or a geostationary transfer orbit and then spiral them out to the operational orbit. You can sometimes spend months getting out there, burning all that fuel, and then you start operations. And they do it that way because it's the least cost, or it's it, lowest cost of fuel to get on out there. Yeah, and it's it's the trade off they have of limited fuel availability. Yeah, and you trade off cost versus versus you know, revenue and decide what the optimum is. Okay. Now. If you could launch without the fuel in that tank, hmm. you could launch more transponders on the same mass of spacecraft, right? The rockets are a fixed size. Sure, sure. And then you can refuel that in orbit. You could take extra fuel. Huh. Or you could have a tug grab you and deliver you. Mm-hmm. And now you're not limited by the size of the fairing. Yeah. It's, it's straight economics, right? How fast can you go? But uh. because you've built that exquisite asset, right, with, with the transponders and everything, you're going to pay for the launch the day that, that you're ready. Right, you don't want to hang around. Sure. So sure. you pay top dollar for that launch. Mm-hmm. High reliability gets you where you need to go. Gets you there on time. Yeah. We launch fuel. Yeah. Fuel is pretty risk tolerant. Hmm. We're going to run inventory on orbit. Yeah. We can handle delays. We can get the fuel to, to space pretty cheap. Mm-hmm. So we've got cheap fuel, loading mm. up an expensive satellite. If that expensive satellite has to carry the fuel itself. You pay top dollar to launch every kilogram of fuel. We pay bottom dollar to launch our kilograms of fuel. There's arbitrage there. So there's so many different ways that the economics end up working in your favor. And if the fuel is cheaper, you Mm -hmm. might as well burn more of it to get to the operational orbit quicker. So now you want even more fuel, right? So the economics work more in our favor because we're launching in bulk. Okay, so you build an incredible, you know, minibus van-sized satellite. You want to put it in geo. You launch it the whole fairing size of SpaceX or somebody out there, it gets on up there. You don't have any fuel in it. You contract with one of the tugboat companies that survive. It takes you from Leo all the way up to Geo. And you say, hey, I want really fast delivery to Geo. And they say, well, that's okay. I can pay pay me more money. I'll deliver you really quickly to Geo. Unlike Joe's tow truck company, they're going out of business. I'll just get my own fuel from Orbit Fab. And now your satellite is up in geo, still doesn't have any fuel. But we can sell you fuel in geo. But you can sell us fuel in geo. And we can sell it to you by the year. Maybe every few months, right? Hmm. So if you have a failure, you haven't sunk all the capital in that fuel. You've only lost a month of fuel. If your market shifts, you can take more fuel and continue. Hmm. Or you can cancel a project and cut your losses. But it's an operational expense. You're not paying the price of that capital that you've had to carry from the beginning. Yeah. At you know, what's your interest rate for a startup company? I'm my equity, my my VC investors want 40, 50, 60 percent a year returns, right? Even a stable business these days is going to want what, 10, 20. Yeah. Like the cost of capital is non-zero, yeah. and you're paying and for for 10 years worth of fuel. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. Any CFO worth their salt is going to try anything to shift capex to opex, right? Lowers the barrier, lowers how much capital you got to raise, yeah, gets yeah. you into business quicker, really. And that's just it's just such a huge advantage. Again, paradigm shift in so many different ways. For sure. So going back to like that that Maxar example, right? That it it failed on them. If this if your service was available back then and maybe there was you know there was only satellite, you know, fixing satellite operations. They didn't even want to go to geo for some random reason. They could have just moved their entire satellite, cost them a lot of fuel, but down to Leo and then get operational fixes right there and then redeploy and all it costs them is fuel and they can just move to a new market share. Is that kind of an example there? Yeah. So that satellite was in a low earth orbit. Oh, right? okay. And it's, gotcha. it's, I mean, you want to be low to get good pictures of the earth. Yeah. Fair. And so, uh, yeah, it, it had the gyros fail. Uh-huh. But it wasn't built in a modular way, and there was no tow truck that could go and, and try to, to fix that. Yeah. Um, what, one thing that's happening with the legacy satellites in geostationary orbit, mm-hmm. rather than try and refuel them, they just attach a jetpack. <laughs> so you can imagine a situation with the Maxar satellite where they just attach a spare gyro. And you can oh, repair it in that way. Just add to it, right? Yeah. Rather than have to do any like surg- robotic surgery. That would be cheaper. There's a whole bunch of different ways to look at that. Totally. And, and we've, we've seen... Every every year or two, somebody's big expensive satellite going to geostationary orbit gets stuck in the wrong orbit. 
Oh, yeah. the, the upper stage fails. Yeah. And you've got this satellite that they're paying out hundreds of millions of dollars in insurance payouts. Yeah. Where they have fuel on board the spacecraft. They can mm. actually use the fuel on the satellite to get to the operational orbit, but by the time they got there, they'd have no fuel left. <laughs> it's a it's a no-brainer for refueling. Yeah. From the insurance industry, the 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 consequence of a failure of the upper stage of the rocket mm-hmm. is now dramatically less, right? It's the cost of fuel. Right, absolutely. As opposed to the cost of the entire mission. And for that for that operator, right, they lose their spacecraft, they lose their customers who are going to have to go elsewhere. Right. right. So even if they get the money back to rebuild and launch the spacecraft, do they still have the customers? Someone else has won the customers? Mm-hmm. It's a huge, huge impact. Well, and the other thing I'm thinking about here is from the from the insurance standpoint, if if the risk just got reduced by whatever factor you want to tack on there, now I can charge you a lower interest rate for your insurance. Yep. And yet again, another barrier lowered exactly to that bustling space economy. So so something really interesting happened to us after we'd, we'd launched in the International Space Station and we were talking about this and we're seeing slowly more and more satellite servicing companies being announced and, and, and announcing their projects. We actually talking with Munich Re, one of the biggest insurance companies in the world, okay. the biggest insurer of satellites and rockets, hmm. and they put together an investment thesis for their corporate venture capital arm saying the risk profile is going to change. Huh. Okay, the consequence and likelihood of these risks is changing. So we're going to need to stay ahead of the game here to correctly price premiums for, for our policies. Yeah. And to maybe create new policies. So we got talking to them at the same time they're writing this thesis and we said, hey, we want insurance. Hmm. But insuring docking two satellites together, okay, that's that's a little bit novel. What we really want to explore is insuring financial products. Because I want to forward sell that fuel. When uh, when a company buys fuel, and when they realize, oh, I can make the fuel tank smaller, I'll buy it every year. Sure. The the CFO is like, okay, firstly, I want to move my capital expenditure to operational expenditure. That's a huge advantage, right? Defer that cost. Massive. Secondly, I don't want to get hold over a barrel for the price of fuel. And if Orbit Fab is the dominant supplier, sure. I don't want them setting the price later when totally. they can charge everything they want and basically own me. Yeah. So I want to sign a forwards contract. You're going to guarantee me the price of fuel. Mm. And so we're quite happy to do that because sure. we want to guarantee that they're going to buy it. Right. So we enter into these forwards contracts for delivery of fuel in a few years' time. Mm-hmm. But then we've got to finance the building of the fuel shuttles and the fuel <laughs> depots and like get our infrastructure up. So right. we want to finance that contract up front, gotcha. which is not a, an atypical thing. They do it in oil and gas all the time. Right. But that company doesn't want to pay for it all up front because of what we just That's discussed. Right. So we go to the, the finance world and say, hey, look, we've got this contract. Totally. It's, it's a commodities contract, like yeah. it's a forwards contract. You're used to these. Do you want to buy them? Like, We're not trading them on a market. That's We're not at that point yet, but we can sure. do bilateral trades. But those types of trades, yeah, that happens in soybean, pork belly all the time. But those folks that finance them, they don't understand the risks of operating in space. Yeah. And so what sort of premium are they going to attach to that, right? We're going yeah. to charge huge interest rates. Uh-huh. But if we can go to an insurance company like Munich Re and say, hey, you understand the space operations risk. If mm. you take that risk and we'll pay you the insurance policy to take that risk, then the finance guys can take the normal finance risk that they're used to. Because and we get on average a lower cost of capital. And so Munich Re, we went to them and said, we, we need you. Like, this is great. And they yeah. looked at us and said, well, you know all of the satellite servicing companies because you sell to them all. You understand where this market is going. Yep. We want that view of the industry. Nice. And so they invested in the company. And so they were our first strategic investor. So Munich Re wow. Ventures is, uh, is now one of our, our sort of earliest investors and, and one of our best partners. They've been really good to work with. That's a good strategic partner to just to make sure insurance premiums yeah, that's that's fantastic. This is this I think is the crux of building the in space economy. Yeah. Is to figure out the business models, right? That's it. That's it. How do you move capex to opex? How do yeah. you reduce the barriers? How do you lower the cost of capital? These kind of things are what are going to make the best companies in space. Yeah. Right. And that's the kind of thing I, I want to help crack across the industry. For sure. Well, and it it's necessary because, like we said in the beginning of this. There's probably more visionaries and long-term thinkers in the space industry than anywhere else because it like it we're, attracts that time. We're kooky. Let's be <laughs> Speak honest. For yeah, well, all right there. <laughs> I've seen you dance. <laughs> but the problem with that is, 
Yeah, but it's still a business. Absolutely right. There's, <laughs> there's, there's no, nothing. There's no magical space pixie dust. No. Right. You, you, NASA didn't like sprinkle pixie dust on and go, look, now it's spaceified. Mm. No, it's it's a harsh environment. Yeah. It's been very unforgiving in the past because there was no reset button trying right. to fix that with satellite servicing. For right? sure, for sure. But there are much harsher environments. The bottom of the ocean is it's a huge pressures. Yeah. It's it's a, a conductive fluid. Salt water is trying to corrode you. The biological is trying to eat you. It's like, that's a horrible place. There's gritty sand that gets in. Like, the sure. bottom of the oceans are far worse to operate, and yet we have huh. like oil rigs and like people operate on the bottom of the sea. Yeah. In space, it's actually very benign. Hmm. It's just different and unforgiving. <laughs> and you've just got to learn to run a business in that environment. Fair enough. Yeah, there's, there's some unique... Hmm. Okay, so if cost of capital has dropped dramatically from you guys, uh, for you guys, if you've been able to connect with a lot of different government contracts out there. Um, where are you guys at in, in funding and like different stages? What has that trajectory been? And yeah, where, where are you guys going? And we haven't succeeded in dropping our cost of capital yet. Okay. We're okay. working on that. All right. Um, There's a lot of elements to that. That's right. I mean, we, we've got to prove that we can get our customers to sign forwards contracts. We, we, actually, we actually did that. Okay. So we, we have right a there. commercial company, Astroscale, Mm -hmm. that have committed to purchasing a significant amount of propellant for delivery to geostationary orbit. Nice. It's, a, it's quite a big contract for us. Yeah. Uh, and so um, that's been proved. That's a, that's a forwards contract, mm. right? It's for delivery towards the end of the decade. Yeah. Now we've got to prove that we can finance that contract, right? <laughs> so we're slowly proving out all these things. Similarly, on the, on the launch side, we want to prove that we can get a great deal. And sure, there's various sure. things we do that, that make these like, particularly interesting, trading off our cost, cost of capital against the launch company's cost of capital, which tends to be lower. So they're, uh, for us, putting out cash up front is much, much worse hmm. than paying them a larger amount later. And so we're sure, sure. very creative deals to lower our yeah. upfront capital and everything else like that. But that said, we're raising VC. Right? Yeah. We've, we've just recently signed a term sheet for our Series A round you know, in the middle of this pretty bad economic environment people are still seeing this is a wow. this is a thing that needs to happen and is going to happen and so we're we're raising funds against that but it's it's vc right it demands silicon valley returns it does and we have to have a business model that fits that and there's no magical pixie dust in space you do not get <laughs> a free lunch because you say space no what you have to do is deliver massive returns to the vcs yeah and so we map this out we we have a huge market right <laughs> All you, satellites. <laughs> how many things change when you get to orbit? At the moment, 50% of everything that's launched to space is fuel. 50%. We spend $5 billion a year launching things to space. Two and a half billion of that is basically spent launching fuel. Wow, wow. All of that is CapEx. Yep. You shift that to OpEx, right? Every single CFO says, all right, I want that. 2.5 billion is our accessible market. And that's before you look at the things that, that we enable, like asset recovery, life extension, uh -huh. uh, you know, the deorbiting services where you want to run that, that garbage collection tow truck, right? You sure, sure. absolutely need fuel. Our market today is about $4 billion. Dang. And we, we hardly started. Yeah, right? You yeah, look yeah. at how much capital has flowed into the industry with the commercial space stations, mm -hmm. tourism, entertainment content. Tom Cruise wants to shoot a movie. It's manufacturing. And you've got Varda, Cisluna. Uh, yeah, yeah. industries uh, space forge like there are companies working on on different ideas for that hmm. people are looking at things that might be exports from space to earth yeah that might actually be able to support the first permanent jobs in space this gets me really excited that yeah, is what yeah. i want to support right and as soon as you hit that inflection point as soon as you have hmm. one permanent job in space hmm. you want to keep that guy up there because he's got a special school maybe it's it's filming right maybe he sure, knows sure. like he was on the tom cruise film 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 set what have you he knows yeah. how to get the lighting right and people floating in space like it's going to be quirky it's going to yeah. be hard to control you've got to velcro things in the right places you've got to be able to also take care of the talent up there and that person yeah. with that skill i want to keep them up there and keep shooting movies and making money i do not want to bring them back to the ground uh, right they're worth money in space i will pay them well time. keep them up there i need to keep them happy yeah. so i send up somebody to take care of the plumbing and hmm. farm some food for them Make them fresh vegetables because I hear mm. in space that's a bad thing, right? And next thing you know, you've got a farmer. Yeah. And they're a permanent job for a plumber. And huh. then you've got real estate. 
<laughs> and eventually we have rotating space stations with schools and kids and hospitals. And oh, yes. we're going to move every industry from Earth into space. In the next mm. 100 years, the economy in space is going to be bigger than the economy on Earth because there's more resources there. Guaranteed. There, are, there is more like novelty to humanity. Mm. We can do things when you don't have gravity in manufacturing that we can't do on Earth. Everything is going to change. It's going to be better life living in space than it is on Earth. That is what we want to enable. So mm. right now... It's only a $4 billion market. <laughs> but easy to grow there. I hadn't, regarding the, like the first permanent jobs in space, I knew of the Tom Cruise filming, which maybe that's like Mission Impossible 12 or 13. I, I don't think the title has been announced yet. <laughs> I don't think it has. Um, I don't think it matters. I just, just, take, I, just take my money. Yeah, I want it. <laughs> IMAX, the biggest thing. The, the rocking chairs, please. Um, yeah, after Top Gun was great. <laughs> it was very good. Um, okay, so I, I have been thinking about the first permanent jobs as an exportable commodity mm. down to earth, like ZBLAN, a really awesome fiber optic cable, or uh, Red Wire Space. Uh, yeah, they also just made a, an optical crystal that can focus um, yeah, for, for high comm lasers. That's really interesting. They're making that and sending it down to research facilities down here on earth. My brain had always been sort of, oh, okay, well, that'll probably be first manufacturing. We need those types of products to enable the uh, the physical infrastructure to then put humans on. Because, yes, we've got satellites. They send down data. That's worked. But if that's all you have, you're not going to get to schools and food and all these things up in space. My brain had not even gone towards the, the filmmaker being up there and learning the art of filming in zero G. It took me a while too. I told you in, in, in undergrad, my list was only two things. <laughs> right, right. That's fair. Now I've, I've added a few. It's grown for sure. Yeah. And I may even one day have to reinstate space-based solar power because the cost of launch is falling. And if we actually get the asteroid mining going and you've got the, the robotic assembly vehicles, yeah, we may get to the point where we can build space-based solar power systems. And that is a $6.3 trillion market. Oh, yeah. Lots of power. There's a lot of money to be made from this stuff. All we have to do is crack the code, right? And the code is make a viable business. Make a viable That's business. That's it. Yeah, and the, the problem, just to, to make sure I'm on the same page, the problem with space-based solar power is if you have to launch all of it from the ground, it doesn't work. That's basically it. Okay. You, you're competing against terrestrial power, yeah. right? And it's very simple. We know what terrestrial players pay. Yeah. And it varies across the world, right? Space-based solar power, we'll be able to drop it anywhere. Mm -hmm. The most expensive power in the world was what the U.S. Army was paying for power in Afghanistan. Mm. Okay, because the logistics were horrible. That makes and sense. And they were trying to get diesel in. Yeah. And it was nasty. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And you don't want to know what they paid per kilowatt hour. It was horrifying. Uh -uh. But most places are you know, in, in the tens of cents per kilowatt hour yeah you get a bill every month you yeah. look at that's, so we know exactly yeah, that's the, the price so we know exactly the number we have to hit right yeah. you can find out commodity prices like actual um uh producer prices for for power everywhere in the world sure and uh and so you can get a green premium i guess from space-based solar power but we also know what the green premium price mm. is right right this right. is very easy to model hmm. but when you go and look at what the input costs are for space-based solar power yeah the launch cost is the biggest hmm. if you have to launch everything from the ground. So the questions are, well, can we get that material in space hmm. cheaper? Even if it's just the bulk material for the structures, right? Maybe we're building concentrators. Hmm. There's lots of ways to, to slice and dice that, right? Or will launch costs come down so quickly that it then becomes viable and we launch thin film reflectors and deploy them, yeah. right? People are sitting down and with, with sharp pencils working on this right now. <laughs> Do I think they've cracked it? No, but I tell you what, we're a hell of a lot closer than we were even a couple of years ago. Yeah. And yeah, if they do, a $6.3 trillion market, yeah. this will take off. You want permanent jobs in space? They just got paid for. They just got paid for. Yeah, I think of the, I mean, right now we have deep sea underwater welders that live in these horrible conditions of these tiny little submarines and there's like three dudes and they're at like i don't know 20 or 30 or 40 atmospheres of pressure like a ton and they just get used to living down there and they're they're not even breathing the same mixture of air that we are 
because their bodies need different stuff. And then they go outside and they're swimming 200, 300 meters below the surface water, something ridiculous like that. I'm sure I'm a little off. And they're welding pipes and such. Those guys get paid a lot of money for a three, a six month gig. Uh, It's like 250K. Yeah. It's really crappy on your health and it's really dangerous down there. But look, they're, that's a viable business case They're because we need those pipes. We need that oil to take place. So it's it's not a far fetch for that list of jobs to just keep on growing. And every export job hmm. supports tens or even hundreds of internal economy jobs. Hmm. That's why looking at that first permanent job is key. Flush that out a little bit. So exporting of the film or... It doesn't matter what you're exporting, right? A tourist experience. Sure. It, it, tourism is, a, is an import business. Oh, sorry, an export business. Okay. Okay. If you're exporting the experience, you're exporting mm-hmm. the, the movie, the bits, right? Sure, sure. You're exporting the, the atoms, the, the Z-blands, the crystals, the things you manufacture. Yeah. You may be exporting maybe platinum-grade elements one day. Sure. Maybe you're exporting kilowatts from from a uh, a solar power station maybe we make aluminum bars which have been called crystallized electricity mm. and we save having to make that on earth i i don't know the, sure. the great thing is once we've built the infrastructure like orbit fabs refueling the the servicing vehicles the orbital reef or, or one of the other commercial space stations you yeah. build that infrastructure other people who are smarter than us <laughs> smarter than me are going yeah. to come up with businesses i've never thought of yeah. Right. The people who came up with the internet had no idea that you could make Uber and Airbnb yep. and oh. and you know Facebook, right? right? They weren't even concepts. Yeah. I've used all three today. <laughs> but that's that's what's gonna happen on this infrastructure, yeah. right? And so I can point to a few industries and say, hey, hey, if we crack the code on these, these are big. It's the stuff that I don't realize and I don't know about. It's yeah, gonna be yeah. really exciting. But you create that as an export job where they're earning things because people on the ground want to pay for them. Yeah. Now you've got somebody in space doing that. Mm-hmm. They're going to spend their time and money improving their life in space, hmm. right? They're going to want companionship, a family, yeah. entertainment, healthcare, decent food. Hmm. How are you going to provide that? You can lift it all from the ground sure. or you can start producing it in space. Yeah. And if you want to stay there, you want gravity because what we've learned from you know, the space station and me and what have you is microgravity kills you slowly. It takes a lot of work. What you want is you rotate a space station, get yourself you know, artificial gravity, centripetal force. You, sure. Then you can spend some time in that. Your bones won't decay. Mm-hmm. You're in a more familiar environment. The equipment we use on the ground to make things works in that environment. Yeah, so yeah. it's cheaper because we don't have to make everything zero-G compatible. Right. But you can always go up to the axis. Yep, yep. And you've got your zero-G environment to make your Z-band fibers or whatever is needed. Right. We're mm. going to end up making those kind of space stations. That's real estate. Yeah. Right now, you onto other businesses, mm-hmm. but they're internal economy businesses from a space perspective, built mm-hmm. on the back of export jobs. Gotcha. Yeah, and there's a lot of still, even with those jobs you just described, there's some terrestrial jobs that will probably for the foreseeable future stay on the Earth, but in support of those jobs that are out in space. And now, you know, we we don't have we we don't have jobs anymore for. Uh, candle lighters on top of gas lights or, uh, you know, street lights sort of thing, poop scoopers for horses. <laughs> yep. We got new ones now. The, the economies change. Yeah, Guaranteed. always happens. One of, the, one of the most exciting things, if you start getting down this path mm-hmm. and we're able to start moving significant amounts of industry like solar power, if we can move all power production to space, yeah. moving all heavy industry to space, Ooh. We'll reduce the, the greenhouse gas emissions. I think this is the only way yeah, yeah. to get to global net zero, mm-hmm. right? We will save the earth by moving these things to space. And I can see a future in which most people live in space because you can have variable gravity there and a whole bunch of interesting things. And the earth is just a massive nature preserve. That I think should be our future. That's one worth fighting for. There's a there's a guy out there on the internet that I've done some of his his sales training and read his books out there, Grant Cardone. Um, and one of the things he talks about is work feels like work to you because your dreams and ambitions aren't big enough. <laughs> right? Interesting. And if, if you make your dreams and ambitions big enough and then they they pull you forward, you're not trying to sprint towards them. They, they just take you there. 
but you have to dream 10 times, 10x what you were previously thinking, what the status quo, what the average people would say to dream. And all of a sudden, if you think that way, the brain's a very interesting thing. Like as soon as you set it on a task, you just see the puzzle pieces that start to into place for that one thing. And so you know, if, if our only vision of a future is less dirty air and less polluted streams and you know, with, with that context of less of the bad, then we'll maybe get a little closer to that. Yep. But if instead it's now heavy industry has gone, it's off, it's off earth or it's underground and it's well-maintained terrestrial world is it's, it's, it's parks, it's residential, it's walking. That's such an insane goal that it, if you believe that that's possible, all of a sudden your brain starts doing weird things. You're like, what if I start a company that refuels gas, you know, <laughs> makes, makes gas stations in space. <laughs> it starts to, it starts to track. So it's all connect there. So, I guess one thing going forward here, because um, it's been a fantastic conversation, really enjoyed it. Um, okay, so you guys finish your, your A round of funding um, and looking towards the future of all of what you've described. What do you guys really need help with? Oh, gosh, that's easy. <laughs> we need great people. Yeah, we, we need great engineers. Mm -hmm. We need to, to you know finish our tech, solve our problems. Sure. And then I, one of the things that, that we're doing here, your audience can't see. We have a 60,000 square foot building. It's huge. Like, whew. we only have 50 people right now. <laughs> yeah. It kind of echoes a little bit. It really does. But what we've done, we started subleasing it to a couple of other companies. We brought them in. We're building yeah. this ecosystem. This is cool. In the building. So in space, we want to be the infrastructure. And like, everybody can get their materials, their fuel, and, and build their companies on that. Yeah. Here, we just happen to get a massively large building. We've got a great deal on it. And so we decided, okay, let's bring those companies in and help them get off the ground. Hmm. So we're building the ecosystem, which is just a lot of fun. So and the biggest thing the space industry lacks is exports. Yep. And I'm trying to find the entrepreneurs yeah. that can make the things that will either be exported or will help other people make the exports. Like I want to build that ecosystem. Huh. So firstly, I want people in our company. And secondly, I want other companies. Sure. And frankly, right now we, we're 50 people, right? Our people are really good at prototyping, finding mm -hmm. new business models, like trying to find product market fit and everything. Yeah. We hit our stride and we're just you know, pumping gas. Hmm. We're, we're going to end up losing some of these early people because they're used to having a lot of control over things and moving so quickly sure. rather than having to crank on something that's reliable and repeatable and yeah. things like that. I expect we'll lose most of them. Hmm. And I want to see every single one of them go and make a great company. Hmm. Maybe come back and, and buy fuel, right? <laughs> but I, I'm trying as hard as we can to grow that ecosystem and yeah. everything that that involves. So, yeah, that, that's what the industry needs is more people thinking about creative business models and finding products and you know, close, close the financial case on hmm. making money in space. I love that. Yeah, as I was walking around, it's it's been interesting how many different space companies I've been to where it's like the founders are... Yeah, I think the youngest founder was in their 30s. Um, the oldest was like mid 50s, no one beyond that. But like, that's just the C suite level. And anyone that's like even slightly below that, it's like in your 20s, in like in your early 20s, is like the average of it. Well, think about how Apollo was built, right? Tell it, me. It was a bunch of 20 year olds hmm. because <laughs> no one knew how to build rockets. Right. right, right. They just got the smartest twenty-year-olds they could out of fresh out of universities and and PhD program and what have you, and they were managed by a bunch of thirty-year-olds, <laughs> and overseen and advised by a bunch of forty-year-olds, and that was Apollo. Roger that. And, and and there's a reason for that, right? When you're young, you're very creative and yeah. you're prepared to take risks, and you might have hubris, right? You you'll stand up for for what you believe. You All might not above. know a lot. But you know, the, the smartest ones, they listen to their elders who tell them what can't be done and why, and then they go and do it anyway. <laughs> yeah. And while most of them fall flat on their face, yep. the smartest ones fall flat on their face four or five times and then find out it's something that's a winner. Yeah. Because you can do things differently with new technology or a new approach or you know, just the world has changed, the market has changed, it's time to try these ideas again. Hmm. And so that's, you, you get that a lot. And I think Silicon Valley is pretty good at that. right? They're, they're a, a company factory in Silicon yeah, Valley. They are. And so you've got people that are having ideas and then you can get help taking it from one to 10 people. 
from, from 10 to 100 people yeah and from 100 to a thousand it's a production line and the mm-hmm. people who work on this section of the production line will bring a company along and we'll get back and find another company right and and so yeah i, I think that that's sort of all, all part of that dynamic uh, the other thing that plays into the space industry is that there's a lot of reliable jobs for government contractors who are on cost plus contracts yep. where the incentive is to pay them a lot because a lot plus 10 percent is better than a little bit plus 10 percent so the incentives there are, are very different hmm. and uh and yeah when you're young you can take a risk guaranteed and so i think that's also another reason we see a lot more young people fantastic okay so if i'm a young engineer out there that wants to create a bustling in space economy to the website to your email yeah do it look me up on linkedin but uh, orbitfab.com is uh, is a good place to start roger that appreciate it Daniel, thanks for having us here. Any other like final messages you got? Any cool things to, to leave audience with? Or we'll uh, we'll wrap it up and say Ad Astra. Sometimes I get asked, right? How how do I get into this business? Sure, right? sure. How do I get started? How do I a project? And um, for, for for people that are thinking that, right? Where do I get started? Just do it, right? Think about the thing that you want to do. Break it down into something that you could get done today. Something you get started on, mm-hmm. and just just do it. We always ask our engineers, what have you built? <laughs> right? But that's that's how I got into it. I, I didn't take no for an answer. I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm, no one's building a satellite. What does that take? I'll try. <laughs> and I may not have succeeded, but I went out and did it and I learned so much. Yeah. So the answer is just find a project, decide on something you're passionate about, just go out and do it and learn. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's a call to action. Just start working on it. Love it. Go out there. Hey, go do some cool stuff. And uh, as always, check out the blue sky because it's fantastic. It's beautiful. And when we get up in space, for a while, we won't have a blue sky. I think someone will figure that out. Get some LED lights on a spinning little disc. But until then, Ad Astra, cheers, everybody. Thank you all for checking out the show. And a really big thanks to the team over at OrbitFab. Uh, they welcomed me into their massive facility with open arms uh, and a hug, which, if you know me, means means a ton. I'm a I'm a big hugger, big fan. A lot of you guys have asked me how to support the show, which really means a lot. Uh, we've had seven incredible episodes, and we don't plan to slow down anytime soon. So you can support by by sharing it, sharing the whole episode, sharing the clips, uh, episodes on Spotify, YouTube. Google Podcast Stitcher, wherever wherever you're listening to this right now. Uh, so appreciate that support. We'll get a merch store up and running one of these days. We're, we're getting there, slowly but surely. Uh, and then lastly, if, if you made it this far, I, I just want to encourage you, choose joy. There's, there's a lot of crap out there in the world on the news cycles, and it doesn't matter if you're you know, vote blue, red, or purple, or green. Like, there's just negative news everywhere. And it really affects the mental health. So, you're an adult. You choose what comes into your brain. Uh, but choose. Choose wisely. Because I, I think it affects depression, anxieties, and levels of joy rather dramatically. And science backs that. So... That's your soapbox for you. Have a wonderful afternoon or evening, everybody. Thanks for checking the show. Blessings.